but really to add my voice to supporting this bill. As we've heard, around one, in, one baby each is born each week in Australia with a severe genetic disorder called mitochondrial disease. It's a largely inherited genetic disease of which prognosis for these children, the ones with severe mitochondrial disease, most will die in their first five years of life, in fact, most in the first year or two. And as a young medical student, I remember learning about this condition in a textbook. It sounded horrible. As it said, Lee syndrome is a severe neurological disorder that usually becomes apparent in the first year of life. This condition is characterised by progressive loss of mental and movement abilities called psychomotor regression and typically results in death within two or three years, usually due to respiratory failure. Very clinical, very cold, very factual. But as a young paediatrician, I saw the reality is not just horrible. It is devastating. It's a devastating condition. Devastating for the infant. It's a horrible way to die. Devastating for the parents as they struggle, first with diagnosing a puzzling set of symptoms. Imagine picking up a child that over days, weeks and months becomes progressively floppy. A baby that might once have rolled stops doing it. First, the parents were a little worried. They go and see a doctor. They become increasingly worried. Strange things are happening. They're confused. They seek help from different specialists. It's not a particularly common set of symptoms and conditions. They can see many doctors before finally it's diagnosed. And it's it's, the diagnosis itself is completely devastating, not just for the family, but also for the friends around that family and for the community. But I can tell you that the conversation that you have as a paediatrician is the hardest conversation that you can have. It's a conversation that you know will profoundly change the lives of these people sitting in your room. In fact, you know that it's not just going to change the life of that child, that child's siblings, the parents, the grandparents, the aunties and uncles and cousins, everybody. And in fact, we're trained as doctors to be caring and supportive and to break news gently. But you know, as that doctor, that the minute you say what is essentially a death sentence, they can't hear anything else. It's like a white wall comes down and they're not going to hear anything, so there's not much you can do to make this conversation easier. You can do all you can to try and make it as gentle as possible, but it is an awful thing to have to deliver to a family. Many of us probably know someone who's lost a child. It is indeed a parent's greatest fear. In fact, I said in my first speech, there are words like widow and orphan that articulate and describe our loss. But there is no word, no word in the English language for the loss of a child. And in fact, I've yet to find a language anywhere in the world that in fact describes that. Because it is almost unimaginable, it's not something we want to be able to describe, it's a, it's a devastating loss. So you can imagine how much devastation families experience and how there are so many wonderful people who've taken this grief and they've converted it into a drive to provide hope for others. They've taken a loss, a pain that will never go away, that never will really dull, and they've used that for the betterment of others to try to provide hope to those who've had to deal with this pain, this loss, this suffering and this grief. As we heard earlier this evening from the deeply moving speech by the member for Mayo, whose family has been affected by this condition and its devastating outcomes, but also people like Maeve and her family for which this bill is named. And that's why, essentially, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are all here today. And I'd like to thank the Minister for Health, the Honourable Greg Hunt, for chaperoning this bill through careful processes 
that engage parliamentary, parliamentarians throughout the chamber across the divide in a careful, supportive way that allows people to come on the journey of discussing what is essentially an incredibly profound decision that this parliament will be making. Profound. And I think it's wonderful that we are, are to be given a conscience vote. And I know that there are many people who have struggled with making decisions around what is essentially an incredibly important form of legislation. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, the purpose of the Mitochondrial Donation Law Bill 2021 is to amend existing legislation to allow for mitochondrial donation to be introduced into Australia for research and re human reproductive purposes. This bill will allow women whose children would otherwise be predisposed to severe and life-threatening mitochondrial disease to have a biological child who would not inherit that predisposition. For those predisposed to the genetic disease, meaning carriers of this genetic disorder, they can now, if they, this bill does pass, have the hope that they can process a mitochondrial donation to limit some of the risks of having a child or having another child with mitochondrial disease. Mitochondrial donation is, in effect, an assisted reproductive technology that, when combined with in vitro fertilisation, and I make note of the fact that Australia has been incredibly world-leading in the area of in vitro fertilisation, commonly known as IVF, but this will provide the potential to allow women whose mitochondria would predispose their potential children to mitochondrial disease to have a biological child who does not inherit that predisposition. Now, the, the technique is a complex process to create an embryo, which includes nuclear DNA from a man and, and the woman seeking to have a child, and mitochondrial DNA from a different woman, the mitochondrial donor. Mitochondrial donation can therefore minimise the risk of transmission of the prospective mother's mitochondria, and in doing so, aims to prevent future generations from inheriting these severe and debilitating diseases. To explain this more simply, we all have mitochondria in our cells. They are essentially the batteries of the cell. They're the energy store of the cell. And those suffering from mitochondrial disease have faulty batteries. It's a bit like if you think about a, a chicken's egg. There's the yolk in the middle, which is the nucleus, and then there's the white part, which is the cytoplasm. And in that, there are little batteries that are the mitochondria. Mitochondria cannot, donation ha cannot, however, be used to cure people with existing mitochondrial disease, nor can it be prevented, uh, can, nor can it prevent mitochondrial disease caused by changes occurring in an individual's nuclear DNA. So this is specifically to do with mitochondria DNA. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to address the report that does sometimes raise its head in the media that mitochondrial donation is three-parent IVF. This is not an accurate description of mitochondrial DNA, in fact, is unfair. Children born using this technology still only have two biological parents, a mother and a father. That is because these children will inherit their characteristics and personality traits from their biological parents through their nuclear DNA, the egg yolk of the fertilised egg. A female donor involved in a mitochondrial donation process only provides healthy mitochondria, only the batteries of the cell. While mitochondrial donation techniques result in change to the genome, they do not involve gene editing of either the nuclear DNA or mitochondrial DNA, which has been expressly prohibited by this bill. So, to put it simply, it will not change the colour of your child's eyes, hair or anything of the like from the donor. It's only the parents that will provide those heritable traits to the offspring. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, a two-stage implementation approach is proposed to introduce mitochondrial donation in Australia. Stage one will see the mitochondrial donation initially legalised for certain research and training purposes and to support selection and licensing of pilot programs to deliver the mitochondrial donation for impacted families. While well, under stage two, mitochondrial donation would be permitted in clinical practice more broadly after results of the pilot program. This provides necessary checks and balances are in place. 
Uh, under both stages of the program implementation, the use of specified mitochondrial donation techniques will be subject to strict licensing and regulatory conditions, which will be overseen by the Embryo Research Licensing Committee of the National Health and Medical Research Council, which is a very esteemed body, extremely careful and diligent in the processes that it, undertaken, it undertakes and has its own very careful framework in which to assess these things. This will mean that the Embryo Research Licensing Committee of the NHMRC will be expanded under the bill to include licensing and oversight of research and training licences, a clinical licence for the initial pilot site, and future clinical practice licences using mitochondrial donation techniques. Approval of individuals seeking access to the treatment will also be required and will be based on clinical recommendations. That means doctors will need to assess whether the patient and family are in need of this technique. Mr Deputy Speaker, the bill also aligns to other Australian laws preventing exploitation and incentivisation for donors. And I, I repeat, this is a very important law within Australia because in other countries there is permission uh, for certain sorts of incentivisation and this can lead to exploitation of donors, donor organs um, and other such like. But in Australia it's a very important ethical framework that we operate under um, and it's very important to make sure that there's a separation um, of these sorts of procedures from any form of um, recipient of fund funding or financing. Donor rights and responsibilities for Australian mitochondrial donation egg donors would be largely aligned to current artificial reproductive technology regulations. This would include mitochondrial donation egg donors would not be considered legal parents in line with current ART sperm and egg or artificial reproductive technology sperm and egg donors under the Family Law Act 1975. This is very important. And children conceived by mitochondrial donation would have the right to apply for identifying information about their donor only when they turn 18 years of age, as is the case uh, for other sperm and egg donation. Mr Deputy Speaker, donor eggs may be provided voluntarily from family members, friends or from individuals who agree to donate eggs or have eggs that are excess to their own need from IVF clinics. Mr Deputy Speaker, not only as a member of parliament or as a paediatrician, but as a parent, with myself having four beautiful, healthy children, I ask that all members take a moment before voting on this bill. Put yourself in the shoes of a parent who carries this gene or these genes, or a parent who has a child who suffers from mitochondrial disease, or even a parent who has tragically lost a child prematurely to this disease. Often we find as doctors that people have one view until it happens to them or their family members. It's very powerful to understand living in someone else's shoes. So I ask members opposite who may be unsure about this, put yourself in the shoes of others, speak to the experts, make sure your questions are addressed before you make this conscience vote. We all have the power to unite on this and deliver hope for a future without this cruel disease. I commend the bill to this House. Thank you.